All right. Um, we don't have much time. I'm going to talk about da'wah, da'wah techniques. I'm not going to talk about the obligation. I think you're all here because you understand it is an obligation upon us to call people to Allah Azza wa Jal. So we're going to talk about techniques. Now, I've got, I have a four-day da'wah course, a two-day da'wah course, a six-hour da'wah course, and a three-hour da'wah course. But we have an hour now. So I'm going to, uh, I'm going to give you, inshallah, Azza wa Jal, uh, like the most effective techniques and very a very brief history of uh, the da'wah courses that or the da'wah course that I've been teaching is that uh, I've been teaching it for close to 10 years and the only reason I keep teaching it is that I know that inshallah azawajal it works and I know this from <clears throat> from emails I get from around the world from people who have attended the da'wah course from people who have listened to an audio version of the course or to the to the video version that's on YouTube. There's an eight or nine hour version on YouTube. There's another three hour version that was recorded here in Kuala Lumpur. And people basically listen to it and try it and they get good results, bidnillah. There's some people who just listen to it, they enjoy it and they don't try it. You have to try it, it's not magic. You have to go out and try the techniques. And those who tried it, they're the ones that I get emails from, from all over the world. Uh, talking about you know how easy it was. One of the things I always tell people is that when you use these techniques, inshallah, you will discover that getting shahada is not difficult. And it, sorry, it's not even an impressive thing. And it, when you you will this is, these are the stages du'at go through. First stage, you're just dreaming to get shahada. Then you get your shahada, and you're very happy about that. Then you start to get a lot of shahadas and it becomes, you start to realize that it's not a big deal. It's really easy to get a shahada. Someone you've never met in your life, 10 minutes you get a shahada inshallah. You, you realize that it's really easy. And I'm telling you, these are stages that du'at go through. But as much as you try to get du'at to save time, they still have to go through these stages. You get to the stage when you realize that taking a shahada or getting someone to say the shahada is very, very easy. And you don't, that's not the challenge anymore. The real challenge in da'wah is following up with that individual until they become part of the community and a regular praying Muslim. They don't need you to call them every day to pray. That's the real challenge. And realistically, that's the community challenge because you need a community to build people. And our religion is based on being together. We are together five times a day. So we have daily congregation, weekly congregation, Jum'ah, yearly congregation, Taraweeh, Eid, this Eid, the other Eid. And then we have congregational prayers that extend beyond the year, such as the eclipse of the sun or the moon. So the religion is about staying together. And as the Prophet ﷺ indicated that the sheep, uh, or the wolf only eats from the sheep that strays away from the flock. So the real challenge is how do I get this person who took shahada to become integrated into the community? He comes to the masjid by himself I don't have, or, or herself. I don't have to call them. They're part of the community, they're active, and so on and so forth. Um, there's, there's a lot of talk and studies about uh, follow-up and what are the best techniques. We, again, we, we're limited in time. So l let's now focus on what are the ways to be an effective da'ya. And we're going to try to present some of the ways to become a quick and efficient da'ya. And I always say the words quick and efficient. Why? Because rarely in da'wah does a person tell you, um, I have uh, five hours, go ahead, start speaking. Rarely does a person have, they have five minutes, they have ten minutes, and, and that's all, even if they had an hour, they don't want to talk about religion for an hour, true? Nobody says, I'm free for an hour, talk to me for, about religion for an hour. They just give me a brief. So you have to be brief then. One of the most important things is that there is no written script. No, at all. You have to basically design your talk based on the person in front of you. You have to know who you're talking to, Based on that person, you click on the right file. So if the person is talking to you and you discover they're an atheist, what are you going to do? Click on the atheist file. If the person you're talking to is a Christian, click on the Christian file. And so on and so forth. Buddhist, click on that file. Hindu, click that file. Muslim who doesn't pray, you have that file also. Click on it. And you're not going to open the wrong file for the wrong guy. Don't talk to, uh, to the Christian about atheism. Obviously, it's a waste of time. So your talk is going to be based on the person in front of you. Look, 
more than learning about the proper way to give da'wah, we're going to, inshallah, unlearn the wrong way of giving da'wah. Just this mentality of a ready script, you must say this, give them this book, it's the best book. Um, now, put the, the, the Qur'an aside, what is the best book for da'wah? Who can tell us? I'm going to tell you in advance, this is a trick question. Huh, what's the best book for da'wah? Public relations. What, what, public relations? Okay, you are correct, but I just want a book, an actual book. What, what is it called? We said Quran aside. And I said it's a trick question also. So you're smart by not answering. There is no one book. Fantastic, thank you very much, sir. Oh, some guy will put his hand up and say, a brief illustrative guide to understanding Islam. Another guy will say, just one message. About the, you know, by so and so. Then another person will say this book and that book. No, the the best book is determined by who's in front of you. In the old days, we used to go with like five different pamphlets and or like four. We'd keep like one here, a bunch of pamphlets here, a bunch here, a bunch here, and a bunch there. And based on the person in front of me, then we'd give the appropriate pamphlet. One of them was about you know Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. One was about the invention of the Trinity. One was about Jesus, one was about, you know, whatever. So, you ask questions, find out the beliefs of the person in front of you, and based on that, you give them the pamphlet. So there is no best pamphlet. We're trying to get rid of this type of mentality of always say this to people, or give them this book. Why do you know, why is this the best book? Because one day I give it to one guy, and he became Muslim. Is that proof though, that it's a good book? Maybe this person read five other books before it, and, this, and he was almost ready to become Muslim. It wasn't your book that got him to become Muslim. It was all the research he did before. Or maybe, yes, there was a message in this book, and it was something that he was very confused about, and that book answered it perfectly for him. But you might give it to another person, and he's not confused about the same issue. It doesn't do the same thing for him. But we're always looking for like the magical thing, the shortcut, the, the rules that you shouldn't break. And there are a lot of du'at, uh, when they do da'wah training, they insist on rules. So one of the first rules, don't insist on any rules. Don't insist. Da'wah is so situational. Like you don't know what will affect the person in front of you. So to say, follow this script, it's wrong just, just to begin with. You, wallahi, and I, I like sharing this story, this is a true story. And it's someone, that was asked, how did you become Muslim? And this is a true story. He said, I was buying drugs <clears throat> from a drug dealer. <clears throat> Obviously, this is in America, right? He said, I was buying drugs from a drug dealer. I'm giving him the money. He's giving me the drugs, the merchandise. And suddenly, for no reason, the drug dealer said, uh, hey, you know who the best people are? Those Muslims, they're the best people. Okay, that'll be $100. Thank you very much, sir. <laughs> Finish the deal. He said, I went home smoked or did whatever with the drugs, injected, inhaled, whatever they do. He said, next morning I woke up, I thought the drug dealer said the Muslims were the best people. Google, 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 found out about Muslims and he became Muslim. Now, you see, what do you learn from this technique? What, what does that tell you we should do? Sell drugs to people, of course. <laughs> right? Of course not. But what I'm saying is that just look at this incredibly crazy spectrum of different things that might affect people, you know. We had a brother who, um, before Islam, he used to love violence and stuff. So after 9-11, every time you listen to the news, the news said, Islam is a violent religion. He said, Ashhadu an la ilaha. <laughs> Basically, that's what he did. He became Muslim because he said, I used to like violence. When I heard that Islam is a violent religion, I said, this is the best religion for me. <laughs> and of course, alhamdulillah, after he became Muslim, he, he learned the truth about it and changed his everything, his opinion, his ideas, his, his goals, alhamdulillah. But the, the point is that the, after all this, even we have such a, a broad spectrum, we still find du'a to make rules. So one time I was uh, you know, giving some of the, the, the suggested uh, suggestions on, on what to say when giving da'wah. And a guy put his hand up, young man put his hand up, he said, I took a da'wah course and the instructor said, you have to mention this, this, this and that. He's saying, you have to mention the six pillars of Iman. 
So now this young man wants to follow these rules blindly. I have to mention the six pillars of Iman. So I said, listen, just listen to the story carefully. The story I'm telling you, this man was a Baptist Christian. All right? So look at who, who's in front of you. If he's a Baptist Christian, why do I have to mention the six pillars of Iman? Let's go through them, see if the Baptist Christian believes in them or not. Allah, and I already spoke about Allah, all right? But they believe in God. Do they believe in prophets, yes. angels, yes. books? Do they believe in the last day, Baptist Christians? Yes. Yeah. Qadr, believe or not, I'm not going to mention Qadr, Qadr, right? Do you agree or not? And that's, you don't explain Qadr when, on the first day you meet someone. You also don't talk to them about jinn. <laughs> there are some invisible things that live with us. They eat your food. Mm, I see. <laughs> right? So, all right, so now here is the thing. This is what we're going to be arguing now. What do I talk about? What are my talking points? I think every single one of us in this room, experienced or not, we know Tawheed is your main talking point, right? Tawheed. Now, uh, and this is the advice of the Prophet ﷺ when he was sending Mu'adh ibn Jabal to Al-Yaman to call people to Allah. So he said, let the first thing you call them be the, the Tawheed of Allah, that they Allah, that there's one God. And that Muhammad Rasulullah, those go together. That's the, the two shahadas, right? Now, from there, the Prophet ﷺ only mentioned two of the other pillars of Islam. Five pillars of Islam. We've got La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Then he mentioned Salah and Zakah. He didn't even mention Hajj and the other things. So we're going to argue, what is the bare minimum that I need to mention before, uh, before someone takes shahada? Before that, let's discuss what... What are the prerequisites to becoming Muslim? Meaning, I'm speaking to someone and before they become Muslim, what do I need to fix in their head up here? And it's almost as simple as the, the shahada itself. When you say, Ashhadu, I testify, I bear witness, and La ilaha illallah, I'm negating. La ilaha, that there is nothing that should be worshipped. I'm saying no, negating. Then affirming, accept Allah Azza wa Jal. So negate, affirm. Ma'roof, it's known. Negation and affirmation, the two parts to the shahada. So now, for me, in order for me to be, uh, for the, okay, let's put it this way. I'm just going to use different language now. For the person in front of me to qualify to say the shahada, what do I have to ensure? Who can tell us? For the person in front of me to qualify to say the shahada, what do I have to make sure of? Naam? Somebody, put your hand up and tell us. What? Saint. 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 Oh, okay. Okay. No, I mean, assuming yes, he's sane and everything. But in order for this sane person to qualify to say the shahada, what do I have to make sure that he understands or believes? Yes, sir. He accepts, the he accepts what? Okay. Very good. Yes? He understands what he's saying. Okay, so like some kind of sane and intelligent person. Okay, We're, okay. basically, we, we make sure we remove shirk from his heart, thought, brain, whatever you want to call it. True? He can't believe that there are seven gods and still, yeah, I'll, I'll say the shahada. Doesn't work, right? <laughs> One time a guy told me, I, don't be I believe the first part, I don't believe the second part, but I'll say it. I said, no, it's not a game, Habibi. We're not going to play games here. So, one, I need to, in their mind, remove shirk. Remove any other deity and God besides Allah. Affirm Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Prophet sallallahu That's enough to become Muslim. Don't get fancy now. I know one day you told me, if somebody has a girlfriend, I don't give him the shahada. <laughs> Is that one of the prerequisites? And he, remove all the other gods, remove girlfriends, and then take the shahada? No, it's not. Oh, so what? I mean, that's why you find Muslims do difficult things. I mean, they make dif life difficult for people who, want, who are interested in Islam. So the Imam, the woman will come, yeah, I'm interested in Islam. Wait a minute. You have a dog? Okay, kill it. That's number one. <laughs> Just try going through her life, you have tattoo, remove it. You have boyfriend, leave him. You have, come on now. What are you trying to save people from the hellfire or put them in it? <laughs> so, one, remove shirk. 
to affirm Tawheed of Allah and definitely going hand in hand with that, talking about the Prophet ﷺ. Beyond that, everyone works at a different pace and a different speed. So uh, hijab, uh, whatever, is sin, these people will change based on their speed. We're not trying to make sure everything is okay now before I give you the shahada. So, uh, so those are the prerequisites to saying the shahada. Removal of shirk, affirming tawheed, and the prophethood of Muhammad ﷺ. Now, what then do I need to talk about? What's the bare minimum do I need to talk about to achieve this goal? Now, if we had a pot, and we're going to put in this pot all the things we're going to talk about for them to say the shahada. So some guy will say, okay, uh, being good to your parents. Yes, that's important. Put that in the pot. The five pillars of Islam, put that in the pot. The six pillars of Iman, put that in the pot. Um, being good to people, having good manners, put it in the pot. All right, night, night prayer, put night prayer, yes, yes. Niqab, put night. Okay, you're gonna keep filling things in this pot, but that's too much to eat in one gathering to digest. So if I let this pot boil and the water evaporate and evaporate, and I want just the bare minimum, the most important things, the bare minimum that I have to speak about before someone becomes Muslim, what do you think will be left in the pot? We're gonna make the argument that most likely it's going to be the five pillars of Islam. The five pillars, why? Because the five pillars, they're, they're very important. Pillars hold up a foundation. So it's like saying these are going to hold up your Islam. I'm going to tell you the five most important things. And after that, whatever you learn will most likely be of lesser importance than this. So these are the most important things you're learning right now. And, and let's, I want to, to emphasize this through or, or explain this through a story. And this story... I call this story Evil Santa. You know Santa Claus? This is his evil brother. I met him in, uh, in Virginia. So I, we stopped at this gas station, my friend and I. And my friend said there's an old man in this, he works in this gas station. He's interested in Islam. Take your time, give him da'wah. So I walked inside. I said, I heard you're interested in Islam. What's happening? He said, well, I am currently reading the Quran. And if I read the whole book and find nothing wrong with it, I'm going to become Muslim. What's your next question at this point? Someone put your hand up and tell us. What, what would you ask now? And you can ask whatever you want. You can say, what's your name? There's nothing wrong with that. Yes? Have you finished reading the whole book? Okay, he said, oh, very good. She, so the sister is basically saying, how much have you read? And he said, I've read one third of the Quran. What's your next question? Yes, sir. Okay, is there anything you're unclear of? You need me to answer any questions? That's not a bad question. Yeah. He said, I've read one third. Yes, sister, again. How is it so far? Very good. So you want, sister wants to see, so now you've read one third of the Quran, any problems so far? And I asked him exactly that same question. I'm not saying that's the best uh, question. I'm just telling you a true story. So I'm not saying I said the best thing. No, it's a true story, so that's what I said. <clears throat> Some of you sitting here, oh no, I have a more intelligent question. I'm just telling you what, <coughs> that you could, you could have a better question. This is just the best, what I, what I came up with at the time. So I said, now I'm going to try to sell him on, I'm trying to convince him that you're okay. It's okay, it's enough to do this. So I said, <coughs> how much have you read so far? He said, one third. So did you find anything wrong in the one third? He said, no. I said, then that's enough to become Muslim and you should do it right now. Meaning, what I'm trying to tell him is that what are the chances one third of the book is going to be from Allah? Because that's what he's examining. He's trying to see, is this book from Allah or is it written by devils or a con man or something like that? So he read one third of the Quran, he said there's nothing wrong with it, meaning it's from Allah. So I'm trying to tell him, if one third is from Allah, what do you think the other two thirds will, will be from whom? Yeah? It's all going to be from Allah. What are the chances? There's going to be a co-author that's the shaitan or something. It's impossible. So I made that suggestion and the old man got upset. He started yelling. He had the problem. He didn't like people to tell him what to do. So he started yelling, you're telling me what to do. Nobody tells me what to do. So I tried a number of things and he yelled. I remember he yelled one more time. So that in the end, there was nothing for me to do except make dua that this man finishes reading the Quran and he becomes Muslim. Now, that's it. There's, sometimes you get to a point where there's nothing to do. I couldn't do anything. Every time I tried to encourage him, he got upset. 
So he said, I told you, I'm going to read the Quran. If I finish the whole book and I find nothing wrong with it, meaning nothing to indicate that it was written by a jinn or a devil or some bad angel, he thought, because the Christians believe in fallen angels, but we don't have this belief. The angel go bad, you know, stuff like that. That went bad. <laughs> so, so khalas, inshallah he finishes the Quran. And then he left that gas station. I never saw him again for nine years. Nine years later, one day I'm just driving by and I see him standing outside. Quickly, turned to the gas station, went to him. I said, uh, how are you doing? Are you Muslim yet? He said, no. So maybe nine years he didn't finish the Quran, right? <laughs> I said, did you finish reading the Quran? He said, yes. So that probably means what? He found something wrong, right? I said, did you find anything wrong with it? He said, no. I said, why aren't you Muslim yet? He said, because right now I'm reading Bukhari. <laughs> I said, well, any Muslims haven't read Bukhari. What do you think you're doing? <laughs> and I pray to Allah, he doesn't hear about Muslim Abu Dawood and Nasa'i al tirmidhi He will never finish. All right. Now, let's analyze this man. What is he trying to do? He is trying to make sure, to, to be certain of what he's getting into. He wants to know everything about Islam, so when he enters into Islam, there are no surprises. But there's something wrong with what he's doing. And it's not realistic, and that's not how we make any decision in life. In life, any decision, you know, who you're going to marry, where you want to live, what you want to study, uh, which car you want to buy, all these decisions, we base them on the most important aspects that we're looking for. If they're there, we accept. Meaning, I'm looking for a new home. I don't tell the real estate agent, whoever's showing me the home, I don't tell him, well, uh, let me move, bring the cat, my wife, and the children, and everything, the dog, and then we'll live here five months, then I'll tell you if I want the house or not. <laughs> I'm trying to buy a car. Oh, I'm gonna drive this car for five months, and uh, see how it is, then I can make a decision, right? You want to, to study, you don't know if you wanna study law, or whatever, okay, well let me do, do two years of law, okay? Yeah, I'll just sit in the class and see how things are. We don't make decisions like that. We look at the most important things. What's important for me in a house? I want three bedrooms, I want two bathrooms, and, and a garage. If that's there, then fine. I make a decision based on that. So, we actually came up with an analogy, because when you have a problem in da'wah, you have to fix it. One of the things that, as a da'ya, you're just like a doctor. When the person in front of you, the fact that they're not becoming Muslim tells you there's a problem. Your job is to find the problem, not to find what's good. That doesn't help you. You go to the doctor, doctor, I can't see from my left eye. How is your right toe? <laughs> your foot is okay? But why are you asking me about what's good? Find, he immediately focuses on what's wrong, right? Doctor will immediately focus on what's wrong, not what's good. How's your hearing? Yeah, I told you my eye, man, forget my hearing. Yeah? So, the same thing, try to find out what's wrong. And one of the ways you do that is you, you look for it or you ask directly. You can ask directly. Like one of the things we used to do in America, we'd, take, we'd ask someone, look, what is stopping you from becoming a Muslim right now? What is it? And they'll just tell you, oh, my fiance wouldn't like it, I love alcohol too much. All kinds of things we've heard. So. So in this, so when you're, 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 um, when you're doing your talk now, you're trying to find out what's wrong or what is the reason they're not becoming Muslim to, with the person in front of you. Now, what was I saying before I, where was I? We were going in, uh, you were in yeah, thank you. The, the, the analogy, thank you very much. So, so basically, like this old man, the example of the old man, he is basically, he wants to know everything that he's getting into. He doesn't want any surprises. But when you explain the five pillars, you remove that fear because you're saying, look, don't worry about everything else and all the, the finer details. I'm telling you about the most important things in the religion. And if they don't scare you, what are the chances something of lesser importance will scare you in the future? And imagine someone who learned about the five pillars, he agreed with them, they made sense to him, and then you bring him to the masjid and you tell him, enter with your right foot and says, wait a minute, huh? Enter with your right foot? This is a strange religion. I'm not interested in this religion. <laughs> what are the chances he's going to do that? It's not going to happen. But your job as a da'iyah is to get people to, to get into a logical mindset or a rational mindset. 
And one of the best ways to do that is to give comparisons to the dunya or give an analogy. So the analogy that we came up with and we started using it and it started working very nicely for us is a car analogy. All right? And we're going to do the exercise together very quickly right now. So what's, what's a very expensive car here? Is the Mercedes expensive enough or not? Huh? Yeah, you guys with your 100% taxes and all that stuff. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, so this, so this um, let's say a very rich millionaire, he takes shahada tonight. And he's so happy, he's so excited, he wants to do something nice. So he comes to you and he says, I have my car, it's parked outside. It's a 2014 S-Class Mercedes. Very expensive car, right? And here's the key. Go out, examine it. If you like the car, you can keep it. You can keep it. Now, I want you to put your hand up and tell me what would you examine. I know some of you probably heard this exercise before. <clears throat> Those of you who heard it, uh, just uh, let everyone else get a chance. So what would you examine in that car? 2014 S-Class Mercedes parked outside. Here's the key. Check it out. If you like it, keep it. Give me a component. Yes, sir. I will not. I'll just take it. You'll just take it. <laughs> Mashallah. <laughs> Mashallah. I like you, man. You'll just take it. Yeah. By the way, I forgot to mention, uh, maybe it was burnt to, completely to the ground, this car. Will you still take it? <laughs> okay, so that means you have to check something. What if it's burnt to the ground? What if it's cut in a train, cut it in half? I would still take it because then you put the front half in there in your garage and you open it and you just wax it and say, Hey, salam alaikum. <laughs> just cleaning the car. <laughs> All right, so what are you checking for in this car? What parts are you checking? Engine, thank you very much. You know why? Because if it, an engine is, is bad on a 2014 S-Class Mercedes, it will cost you tens of thousands of dollars to replace it. And I'm sorry, you cannot put a Corolla engine in it or a Proton engine in it. <laughs> so it's not going to work. So it's going to cost you too much. So I'm checking the engine because it's a main component. What else am I checking? None? Brakes? The car, how, much is, how much is an S-Class Mercedes here? Hundred fifty thousand dollars, hundred seventy thousand dollars, huh? More, half a million, half a million dollars? Uh, half a million ringgit? Okay, so half a million ringgits. So you're gonna refuse a car that cost, huh? Two hundred fifty thousand. Two hundred fifty thousand dollars. La ilaha illallah. Okay, so you're gonna refuse a car that costs two hundred fifty thousand dollars if the brakes don't work. How much does it cost to fix brakes? You know Fred Flintstone? <laughs> That's how I would break, just with my shoes. <laughs> okay, so forget the brakes. We've got engine, one thing so far. What else are we going to check? What, but if it start, by starting, what are you checking? We're checking the engine. What else are we checking? Someone said the body? Very good, because what if the train cut it in half? Or a gigantic container fell on top of it or something. So we're going to check the body. Because if the body is all broken or cut in half, it's going to cost too much to repair. But I'm not going to re reject this car because the radio doesn't work. You know what? Radio is just $100, put a radio in. Forget that, I'll sing. I, uh, I'll drive it. <laughs> Sir? The registration card might not belong to it. Might not belong to <laughs> And I was waiting for that. There's always somebody suspicious in the audience. Right? <laughs> Someone will say, I will open the back, make sure there are no dead bodies. <laughs> He's a millionaire, man. He's a millionaire. He just, he's happy. He became Muslim today. He said, take, take the car if you want it. So yeah, everything is good. Registration is good. No bodies, no bombs, nothing. It's just clean car. So we've got the body. The engine, and the last thing, obviously the most expensive mechanical component. Who's a mechanic in here? Gearbox. The, gear the, the gearbox, the transmission. That's very expensive if it's bad on a brand new Mercedes. But beyond that, everything else, you know, tires. What tires? Are, how much do tires cost? I'll put new tires on it. I'm not going to reject a car that costs $250,000 because tires or radio or button or the antenna is bent to small things like that. No lights, I'll drive during the day. I don't need to drive at night. So khalas. So that means when the most important things agreed with you, as, with the car, you accepted the car. So this is the analogy. The exercise that we just did together now, we actually do this with the non-Muslims. So we'll be standing with them and we'll do this exercise with them. And I'll say, suppose you make up any car, Lamborghini, Ferrari, whatever. 
And then the, if, if the person says something ridiculous like, I'll check if it has keys, I'll go, go make a key for $50, it's okay. So get them to point out the most important ingredients. In the end of the exercise, say, okay, now will you accept the car? And the guy said, yeah. First time I tried this technique, first time ever, was with this young man. We had a dinner for non-Muslims. And at the end, he came forward, he was kind of interested in Islam and everything. So we have to do a quick check with him. La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, check. So now I'm going to explain the, four, the five pillars, the rest of the four pillars, very briefly. And really it's 50 seconds, 50 seconds, quick description, Salah, Hajj, Siyam, Zakah, makes sense? Makes sense. Now, I said, now, do you know how you become Muslim? He said, I don't know. He said, basically, because he agreed that Allah, the concept was okay with him, Muhammad Rasulullah, he is okay with this concept. He said, basically to become Muslim is you, you say with your tongue and Believe in your heart what you just agreed with. So you already have the ingredients of a Muslim. Don't leave this room a non-Muslim. And, you, and you, again, use an analogy. Thank you. Like uh, you tell him, imagine someone studied medicine for six years and the day before getting his degree, he just walks out. What would you tell him? You would run and catch him and say, listen, you have in here the knowledge to be a doctor. Don't leave a non-doctor. How are you going to get married? Yeah? <laughs> Everyone wants to marry a doctor and stuff. <laughs> the point is, it's a waste, isn't it? So to, right now, you are ready to be Muslim. So uh, do it right now. He said, look, even though I've agreed with everything you've said, and everything you said is good and makes sense, he said, I can't basically change my life on just five minutes of good speech. I need to know more of this religion. I need to know what, ex what I'm getting into exactly. I can't just change because you told me some, a few things. Now, th that kind of sounds like it's over, doesn't it? It's never over, right? You got your job, you keep talking. Allah opening their heart, that's up to Allah Azawajal. And that's not difficult for Allah. And talking is not difficult for you. So that's a winner combination, isn't it? Yeah? I'm going to keep talking, and Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala does His thing. So he said, look, I just can't, I, I'm not the kind to make quick decisions like that. I have to take my time and everything. So I could have said, okay, well, have a nice night and take, take care and please read. And No, but not yet, not yet. I'm going to try. So you're just like you're a salesperson, right? Salesperson, pushy salesperson, but we're not pushy though. So I said, listen, I, I really appreciate what you're saying because I'm just like you. I don't make any impulsive decisions. I like to do my research. I like to know what I'm getting into, whatever it is. So I, I like what you're saying, but I want you to, to, then I did the car analogy. If there's a car outside, blah, blah, blah. And when we finished the analogy, I said, will you take the car? He said, yes. And I asked him this question. I remember exactly, this was years ago, but I remember exactly what I said, what he said. I said, so why is it then, when the most important things in the car agreed with you, you accepted the car. But when the most important things in Allah's religion agreed with you, you rejected Allah's religion. And wallahi, when I said that, he looked down like this in shame. And then he said, okay, I'll say it right now. And he took a shahada. You get the idea? Yeah? So that is the benefit of the five pillars because you're saying these are, these are very important issues. Oh, I need to read more. But whatever you read is not going to be as important as these five here. This is what your deen is based upon. So if they don't scare you, what are the chances something of lesser importance will scare you away? Instead of having to put everything in the pot and talk about everything else, no, that's enough for you to make a decision right now. And that's how we make a decision in everything in life. We look for the basic, most important things to us, and if they're there, we make that decision. All right? So, that was the first thing, is that we're saying, so far, what have, have we covered? We said, find out who you're talking to, and you do that by asking questions. Do that by finding what is the obstacle, what is the problem, what is stopping you. And then from there, your talk revolves and circles around the Tawheed and the rest of the pillars. Now, if someone has an issue that's very important to them, do stop and address the issue. Don't ignore it. Yeah? Sometimes it's, it's not an issue that's very serious. One time this lady, and this was in Canada, and she said basically, um, I just have, she said, I have just one problem with Islam. And the minute she said that, I knew exactly. What is it? Thank you very much. The polygamy. Yeah. So the minute she said, I have, I'm ready, I believe everything, I just have one problem with Islam. I said, listen, polygamy? She said, yes. I said, listen, 
That's just, so now, um, are we breaking the rule, just talk about the pillars? No, this is a problem, so you have to address it. Sometimes it's polygamy. I, one, one other woman, she said her problem with Islam is it allows divorce. So we just explained very briefly, 40 seconds, and she understood how divorce can actually be rahmah, and why force two people who can't stand each other, say, no, you have to die together also. <laughs> huh? So it's just too much. So khalas, it was clear. So we have to address whatever issues, obstacles they have. So uh, she said, polygamy said, listen, polygamy, all it is, it's an issue that's allowed. It's not one of the five pillars. It's not like you have to do it. So get married, become Muslim, and marry someone who doesn't want to engage in polygamy. End of story. And it's nobody's business to bother the next guy. Yani if a, a guy here has one wife, his neighbor has two wives. It's not his job to go knock on his neighbor's door. Why do you have two wives? Why don't you be loyal yakhi, to one man? Yeah. The guy who has two wives doesn't come knock on his door. Be a man, yakhi. go get another woman. You know, what's wrong? <laughs> it's, it's just an allowance. It's, it's, you're allowed to do it. You want to do it, do it. It's just like you know, if you're wearing black or green, I don't walk to you. Why are you wearing green? It's just you're allowed to wear green, you're allowed to wear yellow. If you're wearing it, I don't come and question you. End of story. So just this quick description like this, and she was comfortable, okay, I'll become Muslim. You understand? So whatever is the problem, whatever the issue, and you will be surprised at the obstacles people have. I can't tell you how many times we've spoken to people, and they said, everything you said makes sense, and, and I actually could become a Muslim, except I have one problem. And I can't tell you how many times I heard this. I love pork too much. And others, I love alcohol too much. And there are many techniques, there are many techniques, but whatever works for you, use it. And what works for us is we shame them out of that. I, I shame him out of this, uh, this sentence that he said, that I love pork too much. So you, you love pork too much? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created so many different kinds of foods and meats for you. Just look at the ocean and the many, many thousands of different things you can eat from the ocean. Look at the birds and how many species of birds that you can eat. And all the hoofed animals and all kinds of animals that you can eat. And then you can, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created you, you're able to go without food from 30 to 40 days. And all the different kinds of drinks and flavors and juices. And you're going to say, yes, I recognize that Allah is my Lord and I should be worship him, worshiping Him. And he provided me with all these blessings and all these kinds of food, but I'm going to leave all this because of one type of food I don't want to give up for his sake. And wallahi, when we're finished, the person is looking at the floor, and they usually are so embarrassed that they say, I was only joking, of course, I'm, I'm willing to say that. <laughs> I can't tell you how many times we've experienced that. Or the guy would say, oh, I love beer too much. Oh, then we tell him about, you know, every kind of juice and durian and... Uh, <laughs> I said, Durian might make him leave Islam, so just... <laughs> yeah? So you, so <laughs> you get the idea? And Budu and Chinchalu and all these other... <laughs> all the other wonderful... Uh, <laughs> so, you got the idea so far. Find out who you're talking to through questions. Give your talk. And this talk of yours, you practice it. You practice it all the time. It's not like, you know, oh, I know the five pillars. You practice it. So you're in your car, you're practicing your da'wah speech. So you've got this flow. When it's time, you've, you, you have your flow and you tell them about the pillars and you've, you repeat the same speech. Like, if me and you went out for street da'wah, we were partners right now, we went in KL tomorrow, and after about five minutes, you'll be bored of me because I'll repeat the same thing. Yeah? We say in America, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. <laughs> Why are you changing it? Just leave it. As is, same speech. Same analogies, same encouragements. Different problems, give them solutions, end of story. Now, we come to the golden rule. And the golden rule, I told you, um, remember in the beginning I told you every rule is flexible? Except for this one, the golden rule. And it's the only one that I absolutely insist upon. And it's, it, it'll make a huge difference. And I'll tell you, before I learned the golden rule, I used to go stand in front of, uh, of a grocery store and stop customers who are coming in, tell them, I'll give you a five minute introduction to Islam. Then I give them an introduction, and when my speech is finished, I'm staring at them and they're staring back at me. <laughs> and there's just awkward silence, and we're just looking at each other, and like, I'm like. <laughs> and they're just looking at me, like, okay, what? So I thought, when I explain Islam to you, you're going to beg me to let you become Muslim. But it doesn't work like that, because of a number of things. Because uh, psychologically, people don't like changing, even if changing is good for them. 
And you know this from your life and people around you. Someone smokes and it's very bad for them and he can't quit. It's a change. Someone needs to change their eating habit. They're still eating everything. Okay, and, and in, they know they need to do it. So many times people don't like to change their ways. And it gets complex, but we're, we don't have time for all that. Changing, shaitan, fear of the unknown. What if I regret this decision? All these things. And by the way, we're not, it's, it's not a shirt that you can return if you have the receipt, yeah? Many times someone will say, oh, we'll become Muslim if you don't like it. No, mm -hmm. We don't do that, right? <laughs> this is a funny story. It really happened, but it's a funny story, Yanni. Um, it's not representative of the reality in Islam, but there was this guy, uh, one of the sultans in the, in the old days, he used to have a Christian man who would always be in his court, and he was a very nice man, and he liked him and everything. And one day the sultan tells him, listen man, the emir, yani, he said, why did you become Muslim man? The guy said, honestly, I don't have a problem with it, I just love drinking. That's why I'm not going to become Muslim. The Sultan said, don't worry about it. Become Muslim and drink. And you can say the Shahada and be a drinker. There's some Muslims who drink. So the guy said the Shahada. Then the Sultan tells him, listen, now, if you drink, we'll whip you. And if you leave Islam, we'll kill you. <laughs> it was, it's a true story, even though that's not how it works, realistically. Okay. So, so now, what's the golden rule? The golden rule is ask for the shahada. We call it going for the gold. Go for the gold. That's the golden rule. Ask for the shahada. If you don't ask for the shahada, you will find that you're not an efficient da'ya. One. Two, you're a very, very strange person. I'm going to explain why you're a strange person if you don't ask for the shahada. But let me tell you how effective this rule is. And there's a difference uh, between an effective da'ya and a successful da'ya. An effective da'ya, he'll get shahadas, but that's not really successful. I'll tell you why. Take a guess, okay? I'm just gonna give you some numbers. Pick any random city in America. I get my da'wah team together. We go out, give da'wah for a couple of days, and we get 50 shahadas. And as most, the style now, you get the 50 shahadas, you come back, you tell people, and everyone makes takbir, but we don't call them, we don't bring them to the masjid, we don't do follow-up. So I don't do follow-up with these people. I come back two months later, and I call all 50 of them to see how many of them remain Muslim. I want you guys to take a guess, because we don't have any definitive study. But if I give 50 shahadas without any follow-up, or teaching them salah or anything, I call them two months later, what percentage of those 50 do you think will remain Muslim? Will still be Muslim? 5%? Zero. Zero? Okay, let me, let me make it organized. Who thinks maybe, tw who thinks 20% or more? Okay, that's too high. Who thinks maybe 15% will be Muslim? Who thinks 10% will remain Muslim? Yeah? Okay, 9%? 8%? 5%? Yeah? 3%, 2%, 1% will remain Muslim. Who thinks nobody will be Muslim from the whole 50? There's some baraka, man, some baraka. <laughs> nobody? Okay, by the way, I'll tell you, this question, because we don't have any definitive research, the next best thing is to ask people du'at who've been giving du'a for years and years and years. And any time I meet a da'ya who's been giving da'wah for years in the UK, Australia, wherever, I always ask him this question, just so I can gather more data and see what, what is the, the, the idea out there. And, and almost all du'at I've spoken to about this issue believe it will be about 1% to maybe 2% will remain Muslim. You see what I'm saying? It's not impressive to get a shahada. You have to do the follow-up. So the successful da'ya is the one who gets one shahada, follows up with that person until they're part of the masjid, part of the community, praying by themselves. You don't have to wake them up or call them. He goes and gets another shahada. Just work. Even if he does one a month and he builds them up till they're part of the community, that's blessed. But the guy who gets 50 and then he doesn't, he's just effective da'ya, but he's not a successful da'ya. So I want to tell you about the difference in effectiveness between uh, when, I heard, when I learned the golden rule and I didn't know the golden rule. When I didn't know it, I would stop people in front of that store, give them a five minute introduction, and then they're staring at me and I'm staring back at them. 
The difference in effectiveness was five shahadas per day after learning this rule. The rule is, as we said, go for the gold, which means ask for the shahada. We said, if you don't ask for the shahada, you can't be an efficient da'iyah. I showed you the difference in effectiveness. Two, you're just a very, very strange person. I'm going to describe something to you and tell me if this is a strange person or not. So, this is my house. This chair is my house. And I'm with a, a friend here. Whoever, stranger, Muslim, non-Muslim, I'm telling him, I would like to invite you to my house. Okay? So we start walking now. And I'm going to tell you about my house. My house is beautiful. You will love it. You will be comfortable in it. And I think it suits you better than the other place you're in. And I'll just keep talking to him about how wonderful my house is. Then when we get to my house, I have all this time to get him right here. When I got him all the way to the doorstep of my house, I open the door, I enter, and I tell him, well, it was very nice talking to you, and hope to see you again, and I close the door in his face. Now, can we agree that that is a strange person? And if someone invited you like that and shut the door in your face, wouldn't that be a strange person? Same thing, we're just going to change some of the words now. Instead of, I would like to invite you to my house, I would like to invite you to Islam. You're going to love Islam. It's fantastic. It will make you comfortable. You will be comfortable there and everything. And when I get the person to the doorstep of La ilaha illallah, it was so nice talking to you. If you have any questions, feel free to email me. Or, and I close the door in his face. You see what I'm saying? If you don't ask for the shahada, you're just a strange person. You bring people to, the, to there and then you just leave them. You're a very strange person. Tell me one time the Prophet ﷺ went to call a group of people to Islam, got there and didn't call them to Islam. Even the question sounds strange, right? So you have to ask for the shahada. And that's the golden rule. And that's the difference between an efficient da'ya and an insane da'ya. And uh, it's also the rule in many other areas. For example, in, uh, in sales, in one area they're trying to study what gets why do people refuse to commit to a sale? And you know, there are obviously a thousand and one different reasons why you don't buy something. Okay? The price was too expensive, it was the wrong color, it was the wrong size. Thousands of different excuses not to buy something. But they did this study in one area and they found that 96% of the time, the sale didn't happen because the salesperson didn't ask for the sale. You have to ask for the sale. If you don't, 96% of the time, that's why the sale failed. The 4%, the other 4% had the other 1,001 explanations in it. You understand how dramatic that is? So, the Prophet ﷺ, every time he, he wanted to call people to Islam, he actually asked them to become Muslim. You as a da'i, you have to ask them to become Muslim. I follow this rule so much, even if I'm sure the guy is not ready to become Muslim right now, I still ask for the shahada. Because asking for the shahada puts it in their mind that they need to become Muslim. So what, listen to what's happening here when I tell someone, so are you ready to become Muslim right now? And they say, mm, not right now. What does that say? It says, I have accepted the idea that I need to become Muslim, just not right now. You understand? So like I said, I, I, I use this rule, even if I know the guy's not ready, I still say it. It can also, um, this is rare, but it, can, it might even tell you that you haven't uh, covered all the ground you thought you covered. For example, you tell the guy, so would you like to become Muslim right now? He says, Muslim? I have my Lord Jesus Christ. And, okay, <laughs> wait a minute. <laughs> I, I, apparently we were not on the same page. But I can't tell you how many times I ask someone for the shahad and, and they're like, I'm, I mean, if they don't answer, in the affirmative, they'll say things like, oh, well, you know, I, I need to do a little bit more reading and so on, which will bring us to the second golden rule. But here, ask for the shahada. And you have to. People, we said, are afraid to change. They don't want to change their whole life or, their, you know, whatever it is. But you have to ask them to become Muslim. If you don't, why are you talking to them? Just explain to me. What motivates you to go to speak to people, to get them close to Islam, just to leave them like that. So ask for the shahad. That's the first golden rule. Um, and usually I just spend a lot of time just stressing it, but because we don't have much time, consider that I stressed it. <laughs> All right? Absolutely important. Otherwise, what are you doing? Now, 
You can also link that to the second golden rule, and that is create the urgency. Not pressure people, but create the urgency. Many people think, yeah, I have the, I, the rest of my life to read the Quran and read this book and analyze and, and go to the masjid. And some people even want to make hajj before they become Muslim, you know? So, no. Some people fast. I met a guy who fasted all of Ramadan. He was in the, and all his friends are just so happy. Oh, it's so cute. He's fasting. Ya tell, get him to say the shahada. What's cute? He can get ajr for the 30 days, and now it's just no ajr. Day of Eid, I met him. So do you now? Now you say the shahada, you know. And of course, based on the person in front of you, you also know how much you can joke with them, push them, things like that. So, for example, with the African American community in America, it's very easy to, to, in general to speak to African Americans. So, I say, look, man. You, you're ready to become Muslim, all right? So I'm not going to leave you until you become Muslim, or you give me a very good reason why you won't become Muslim right now. I'll leave you alone. And the guy would just laugh. Oh, <laughs> okay, let me, you know? But so the creating the urgency. In sales, they call it the doomsday approach. That's why they have the one day, one day sale. They have coupons with expiration dates. You know, you know, this coupon will work until July 12th. So to get you to, if you get a coupon that says, uh, you know, ends Yom Al Qiyamah, for example, <laughs> who's going to feel the urgency to go use it? Nobody. So that's why every time you go to a car dealership, oh, this is the last six cylinder car we have. This is the last convertible that we have. This is the last red one that we have. You know, because they always try to get you to act now. So uh, the urgency, creating the urgency. And the Prophet ﷺ used this technique multiple times, multiple times. And that's why if you ever read the seerah looking for da'wah techniques, you, you'll be amazed at the amount of techniques in there. So on the eve of the conquering of Mecca, the Prophet ﷺ used it with Abu Sufyan. Isn't it time for you, ya Abu Sufyan, to bear witness, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Abu Sufyan said, first, the first part, La ilaha illallah, I don't have a problem with it. He said, the second part, I still have something against it, Muhammad Rasulullah. Yani. So Al-Abbas was there and he nudges him. Do it, خلاص, enough. So he said the shahada. Now, when he said it, Iman really didn't enter his heart. And he admits that it entered his heart the second day. But at that time, he just said it. Now, I'm not encouraging you to go get cheap quality shahadas, you know. To just you know, go, say it in five brothers. Come on, say it now. So, and that doesn't mean anything. Because, because from the conditions is to know what, it, what you're saying. And it's from the conditions to believe in what you're saying. I met a brother. And he was a famous da'i in our area. And he used to trick people into saying the shahada. Um, one time he was standing there with a non-Muslim. And I'm right here. That's it. And I saw him and heard him telling the non-Muslim, for example, for example, say after me, Ashhadu. <laughs> the guy said, Ashhadu, Allah, Allah, Allah. In the end, he's like, congratulations, you just became a Muslim. <laughs> And he's hugging him, and the non-Muslim is not hugging him back. What, what, what just happened here? You know, you can't just trick me like that. And then he would tell people, "Yeah, alhamdulillah, the guy took shahada." No, Allah says in Surah Muhammad, "Fa'alam annahu la ilaha illallah." That's why the scholars put it as the first condition that you have to know what you're saying. I just bring 500 non-Muslims. Everybody, just for fun, say, "Ashhadu." Okay. Then now write your addresses down. Someone's gonna wake you for fajr. <laughs> Doesn't work like that. So, creating the urgency. You want to, here's an actual example of creating urgency for a true story, Yani. So we were at an, another dinner for non-Muslims. At the end, they brought this young lady, and she was interested in becoming Muslim. So, we, you have to do a check with her. La ilaha illa Muhammad Rasulullah. Check. Pillars of Islam. Check. Any problems? Any issues? Any questions? No. Check. Okay. Then and same repeat the same story every night every time and so listen. So you know how you become Muslim? She said, No. It's very simple. You have to say with your tongue and believe in your heart what you just said you don't have a problem with. That there's only one God worthy of worship. Muhammad is his final messenger. You just agreed with that, that's enough to become Muslim. Mm, I'm not ready yet. But look, if you have the ingredients of a Muslim, why are you gonna walk out of here non-Muslim? Same doctor analogy. Okay. You mean one, this or the other? No, please. Huh? 10 minutes to one hour. Okay, to one hour. Okay. I, I thought you were saying 10 minutes to one hour left. I was like, <laughs> okay. 
So, you understand? Same analogy, doctor analogy. If it works, just keep it. So then she said, no. Um, I'll, just, I'll just wait. Um, I said, okay. Uh, she said, no, she said, I need more time. Now, now what we're going to do is we're going to negotiate. We're going to negotiate. Imagine you had a, a car dealership. It cost you a lot of money to open this car dealership and you want people to sell cars. But you have one salesperson, he will come, he's very nice, he puts people in the car, they test drive it and everything. When they're finished, he just says, thank you so much for test driving the car. It was very nice, I enjoyed it. He doesn't sell, what would you do? You fire him immediately. So, so this lady now, she said, I just need more time. Now, I don't know what that means, more time. So this is a technique, we, again, we don't have time for it, uh, but it's called quantifying. Quantify is like when someone says something that you don't understand what it means, try to find, put a value on it. Yeah? This is a technique used by lawyers and people. To, oh, I was a hard worker. So I, don't, I can't challenge hard worker, but I can quantify it. So what do you mean by hard worker? Did you work Monday through Friday? Yes. You took every other Friday off? Yes. And you worked from 9 to 5 o'clock, correct? Yes. Did you work overtime? No. So basically you worked from Monday through Friday, 9 to 5, and you took every other Friday off? Yes. Suddenly this hard worker, I put a time on it. That's called quantifying something. So she said, I need more time. I said, okay, how much time do you need? She said, two months. Now, what are you going to try to do now? See you in two months? You going to give up that quickly? No, I'm going to try to bring down this, this, this time period of two months. So, and I, this is exactly what I said to the sister. Exactly. I said, look, two months, it's too long. Two months or too long? It's too long. She then says, okay, Friday. And it was Wednesday. So, that means what? Thursday, Friday. Notice, from one sentence, she goes from two months to two days. You see why it's worth it to try? Now, I'm still going to try. I'm not going to give up two days. What's the difference between two days and two day? <laughs> right? So I'm going to try again. So I said, listen, what will happen to you in these two days? What, what are you going to discover or feel or what will happen? You will fly. What will happen? So you already have the ingredients of a Muslim. Do it right now. Become Muslim right now. She said, no. Friday, I'm going to come to your center. After the class, I'll take shahada, inshallah. I said, that's, that's, I don't want to pressure you. That's all I can do and it's encourage you. And there's nothing I can do to change your mind. She said, no, that's it. Friday, I'll come and do it. I said, okay, just do me a favor from now until Friday. I want you to drive slowly and very carefully and wear your seatbelt and don't die until Friday. <laughs> She said, you're scaring me. I said, well, that's, I'm sorry, but that's how the angel of death works. He doesn't say, oh, she has a Friday appointment. Saturday we come see her, inshallah. <laughs> so I told her many people have died while they were interested in Islam and reading about Islam and they didn't do it. So it's fine. I'll see you on Friday, but just drive carefully and don't die until Friday. And I went home. Any pressure? No pressure, right? <laughs> so uh, I get in the car. I start driving home. And, and a few minutes later, the sisters called my cell phone. Assalamu alaikum. She took her shahada, alhamdulillah. <laughs> so the point, people, is the... Okay, this is what I really am trying to avoid. Remember, we said we're going to unlearn the wrong way of giving da'wah. I can't tell you how many times someone will come to the masjid ready to take the shahada, and a Muslim will stop them and say they're not ready. I don't know who you are. What do you have? Shahada vision? Or how do you, how do you know when someone isn't ready? A guy will come to the masjid, I want to become Muslim. A guy will tell him, no, no, you're not ready yet. Go take your time, read again. Read. Why? Why? Wallahi, one, one time a friend of mine said, I walked into the masjid for Dhuhr. A non-Muslim said, I want to become Muslim. He said, I immediately said to him, say after me, Ashhadu, and khalas, no joke, I'm not going to waste time. He said, in the middle of the shahada, an uncle came and stopped me. He said, no, no. You go, read some more, take your time, think about it. He said, the guy walked out, I never saw him again in my life. One time this guy, um, uh, he, was a, he was a speaker I met somewhere. And he said, when I took my shahada, I went to the masjid and I said, uh, I want to take the shahada. And the people in the masjid told him, uh, the guy who gives shahadas, he isn't here. <laughs> but, <laughs> so this guy's like a certified shahada giver or something. 
He said, you'll be back in an hour. The guy said, I sat down and I waited for one hour and then I took the shahada when he came. But imagine, subhanAllah, the guy said, okay, I'm going to go get something to eat across the street and a car hits him. The urgency, wallahi, there was a sister, she was doing her dissertation with a professor. This man loved Islam. You can't believe how much he loved Islam and Muslims and everything. You can't believe. And she said, we're working together, a group of us. And he said, I'm going to go get a drink of water. He goes inside, he gets the water, the cup falls, he falls dead. No one ever gave, offered him. No one went for the gold with him. No one said, you have to do it now. You don't know when you'll die. You don't know how much time you have. How many Muslims would just stop people? Just take your time. Think about it. You know, think about what? What's going to happen? Go take a shower. <laughs> have some soup. What, what are you telling him? Man? What is this nonsense? Uh, you know, udon noodle. <laughs> what? You have a recipe for this guy? Okay. I know times I want to give one more example just to show you how you get people to think rationally. There was this uh, lady in America, non-Muslim, American lady, and she used to register for all the Al-Maghrib courses and take the whole course, double weekend course, four days, and she takes notes and she registers and everything, and she pays. Next course she'll take it, next course she'll take it, next course she'll take it, and these courses come every two months, every month and a half, every three months, and she'll just be taking courses. So one day one of the instructors said to her, uh, why don't you become Muslim right now? She says, I'm not ready yet. He, watch this. I want you to see the frame of mind he put her in. Very rational. He said, how will you know when you're ready? She said, I don't know. She doesn't know what the sign will be. She's just waiting from, for some sign that she doesn't know what it is. He said, okay, let me ask you a question. Do you believe in your heart that if you became Muslim today, you would become a better person? She said, I'm positive I'll become a better person if I become Muslim. He said, then do you think you'll also be happier in your life if you become Muslim? She said, I'm sure of that. He said, then why would you delay something that you're positive will make you happier? Positive will make you a better person, waiting for a sign that you don't even know what the sign is. You see, the, do you see how he put it in front of her like that? Bam, she became Muslim right then and there. But what's happening like, oh, it's so cute. Oh, white lady taking Islamic class. Ha, ha, ha. No, somebody give her the, <laughs> somebody go for the gold, all right? Somebody do something. All right, so these, I know, I know that was very brief. I want to close by saying this. You're probably thinking, yeah, come on now, one hour, and you're telling us, talk about the five pillars, ask for the shahada, find the problem, offer a solution, ask for the shahada again, Create the urgency if they want to spend the rest of their life reading. You don't have the rest of your life. You don't know when you're dying. These, these few points that we mentioned right now, yeah, and let me tell you something. Uh, again, just you don't have time for me to tell you story after story, but I've been doing this for 10 years. And the only reason I tell people, the only reason I keep doing this is that I know it works. I can just tell you about the emails I got. There's a guy who heard a five hour version of this workshop. There's an audio version online. He sent me an email from the UK. He said, I listened to, to half the workshop and I paused it to go buy some dinner. He said, on the way I saw a non-Muslim, so I tried something from the class. The guy said something back. I said something back from the class. He said, before a few minutes, the guy took his shahada. He wrote me back, he said, the guy became Muslim. I only listened to half the class. So um, there's an eight hour version on YouTube called how to get a shahada in 10 minutes. There's a five hour audio version somewhere online, how to get a shahada in 10 minutes. There's a three hour version we filmed in Kuala Lumpur a few months ago, it's called how to get a shahada in 10 minutes. There's this one hour version that it's going to be, I don't know where, it's called how to get a shahada. <laughs> Alright? Um, and uh, we already did the course in, the, in, in Kuala Lumpur, it was a four day, it dealt with atheists, Buddhists, everybody, right? The point is, it's the same techniques, just go out and try them. All of them we have evidence for from the Quran, the Sunnah, the techniques used by the Prophet but we didn't have time to go into all these details. Just go out, have your basic talking points ready, Tawheed, this and that, ask for the Shahada. If they say no, there's a problem, find the problem, offer a solution, ask again, there could be another problem, find a solution, ask again, and if they say I'm going to read, I'm going to take my time, to, when is the angel of death coming, how do you know, da da da, and that's the end of that story. Wallah, inshallah, just try this and you will see the difference immediately. The problem is I've been doing this 10 years and there are two groups of people. One group, they enjoy the class, they never try it. 
The other group tries it and they can't believe how easy it is. And I have so many testimonials from people who said, he made it sound so easy, I thought he was just exaggerating. I thought he was just saying, making it sound easy to encourage us. And then the guy said, I've never given da'wah in my life. We went to the street the next day after the class. He said, I got two shahadas. You know? So just try it. And then you'll discover it's not about getting shahadas. It's about following up, inshallah. So uh, we'll do whatever the organizers decide from here for this point. But at least for, this, for the techniques, I'll stop. Thank you for your attentive listening. Sallallahu wa baraka ala Muhammad wa ala ali wa sahbihi ajma'in. Zat al khair wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah. First, we'll rule that uh, never miss on offering shahada. Uh -huh. Like you give the analogy of calling to your house. But what if from the first, like the words you say, he's not interested in the house at all? Would you Wonderful. Still, and how would you like go for something like that? Very intelligent of you. Zat al khair. May Allah increase you in attentiveness. The... Um, because I was so rushing, usually when I explain this part, I clarify that when do we apply the golden rule? When the person is right there, you understand? Meaning, when do I apply the golden rule? When do I ask for the shahada and insist upon asking for the shahada? When the person agrees, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, and is okay with the pillars. Not any guy, you understand? So this is the problem, that people just want rules and they want to put the rule anywhere. So you're 100% correct. If the person is not interested in the house, then I have another file I'm clicking on. That file is make him interested in the house. Tell him more about the house. Show him about the house. Talk to him about the house. But you only ask for the shahada when the person is ready for it. Meaning, meaning by ready for it, they've got everything in here that's okay. They believe in one God. You removed all other deities. And the Prophet ﷺ is a genuine prophet. And then you can, if you want to even, explain some of the other pillars, if you want. If you don't want, khalas, and no one can insist, oh no, you have to, brother. So, at this type of person, you absolutely, 100% must ask for the shahada. Otherwise, then you're that weird person. But, if they're not even interested, then don't. You, you know. Okay, and, and just one very, very beneficial, very quick point here. The technique has to be applied to the right person. And I'm just going to answer, the, I'm not going to do a, the exercise, it's just the answer. A guy came to me, he said, I, uh, I don't understand how the, a man, he said, I used the da'wah technique of the Prophet وسلم, and it failed. And, and how can his technique fail? So what happened? He said, uh, I spoke, you know, remember the young Sahabi who came to the Prophet he said, Ya Rasulullah, eh, then leave his zina. Ya Rasulullah, give me permission to commit zina. What did the Prophet tell him? Would you accept that for your mother? He said, no. Would you accept it for your sister? The guy said, no. He said, the same way other people don't accept that for their mothers or their sisters. Made dua for him, went on, became a, good, a great man. Now, this guy tried it with someone in America. He said, the guy said, I, if, if, yani, I don't care about zina. The guy said, would you accept that for your mother? The guy said, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Wallahi. He said, would you accept it for your sister? The guy's like, yeah. Then he's asking me, how can this technique fail? You, you, know how the te you know why the technique failed? Because you're applying it in the wrong place. The Prophet tried this technique with a Muslim who understood halal, haram, iman, haya, jannah, nar. Then you're trying to apply it to someone different. So you are correct 100%, Zakir khair. You, you, you go for the gold when the person is at that level. I don't want to go too long. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wallahu ta'ala alam. Zakir khair. No. Okay. okay. My name is Aisha and I'm a psychology student. Mm -hmm. My question is, um, okay, let's say this man believes that Muslim has a stereotypical belief, like from their prior knowledge, that a Muslim is supposed to appear in a certain manner, like for example, how a female Muslim is supposed to be like and everything. So if you approach them mm -hmm. and then um, they end up um, insulting you personally, like saying, you don't even look like a Muslim and everything. Or if they don't insult you personally, they insult what you know the people you you have the same belief with, you know, like are you saying are like, Muslims. Like a yeah. sister who doesn't wear hijab trying to give da'wah, for example? No, a person who doesn't look appropriate to give da'wah. Like for example, they have bad like, teeth or something? <laughs> <laughs> what does that mean? Meaning like let's say she's not wearing a proper attire. Uh-huh. So, not, not hijab, hijab is not nice. No hijab or not nice hijab? Let's say non-hijabi. Okay, all right, so, well, 
Yeah, first of all, find someone to give the non-hijabi dawah. <laughs> but, but, but I understand what you're trying to say. I understand. Look, and this is the idea. There are two, two things that are important. One, you're telling the person, I'm, I'm conveying a message of truth to you. I'm not presenting myself as a role model to you. Okay? So that, because then you, you don't want anyone to paralyze you from speaking because, well, you're not perfect. Yeah, I'm not perfect. So can the sister who's not wearing hijab give dawah? Yeah, and if you insist no, then what's this rule based on? So a sister is not wearing hijab, and she has her best friend who's a non-Muslim, and one day she tells her about Islam. And then her best friend says, well, you don't even practice Islam very well. She said, yes, that's a flaw in me. I'm not selling you my flaw, I'm selling you the good religion. End of story. Never allow anything or anyone to paralyze you from da'wah. Yo, yo, look at you Muslims, look what they do. Again, we distance. The, the Islam from the actions of Muslims. Oh, the other day a Muslim robbed the bank. Type. And this is how America is. His religion only comes up in the news when he is Muslim. But if a Christian guy robbed, they a Christian man today robbed the bank. No, but if the Muslim robs the bank, Muhammad Abdul Jabbar <laughs> robbed the bank. You guys remember a few years ago, well, you guys are far, but do you hear, have you, do you guys hear of the DC sniper? Yeah? The DC sniper was a guy, and basically he would just randomly shoot and kill people. And he was in our area, like our neighborhood exactly, where he was doing all the shooting, right? This guy used to be with Nation of Islam 20 years ago. It was a fashion for black people to be with Nation of Islam, not Muslim. And everyone would change their name to Abdul and Muhammad. And all. So 25 years ago, his name was Muhammad. And in 25 years, no living thing ever called him Muhammad. His name was John Allen Williams. But what was he called in the news? Muhammad. <laughs> That's it. Anyways, so then distance yourself from the mistakes, the di sorry, distance Islam from the behavior of Muslims as un-Islamic. Distance Islam from your own personal mistakes. And you say, look, we're all improving, we're all learning. But the fact that I don't wear hijab is not a reason for you to put yourself in the hellfire. Bam, you reverse it on them. Allah Ta'ala, we don't want to go for too long. Can I just, I can repeat the question to save time for the microphone. So, we'll take that question. Okay, My question is, how do we do that on the people who are closer than that we used to do jahila things? So, sorry, I'll, I'll come to you sister, you just hold on that, to that mic. How do you give that out to people you? Um, we used to do jahiliya things with, um, uh -huh. and we started going doing that with them and they started going like, um, why are you doing this to me? You, you're not, you're not supposed to be like this, you were not like this, you're not someone who's still kin to religion, then you start okay. going to religion. Okay, so how do you give da'wah to people that used to do things with in jahiliya? And they tell you like, why are you saying this to me and you're not supposed to be this, this person? It's very simple, it's really easy. I mean, this is one of the easiest questions ever, right? And all you do is you, you explain to them, look, I did all these things and now I, I basically, Allah guided me or I, went, I found something better or discovered the, how wrong they are. And the only reason I'm coming to you is that you're a good friend of mine and I care for you dearly. And if I didn't care for you, I wouldn't be here telling you about this. And if I didn't experience both lifestyles and knew which one is better and want to share it with you, I wouldn't be here. It's just that simple. All right? Very simple. And never allow someone to tell you, oh, oh, oh now you're giving me da'wah? You forgot the days when you used to do this and you used to steal that and kill this. So listen, this technique, this is Fir'aun. <laughs> uh, no, I'm not kidding. For real. This is what Fir'aun did when Musa السلام, came to him with, with Harun the first time and gave him da'wah that I'm the Rasul Rabbil, I'm, I am يعني, Rasul Rabbil Alameen, I'm the messenger of the Lord of the world. What did Fir'aun do? Immediately start to mention the, 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 the past of Musa. Alam nurabbika fina walida. Didn't we raise you as a young boy amongst us? Walabitha fina min umrika sinina and you lived with us for a long time. You killed the man, huh? You forget, you killed the man. What does it have to do with anything right now? It's the past. But some people try to bug you down with what? Yeah. Oh, now you're telling me pray? You forgot you used to smoke, huh? Now you're telling me pray? But what does it have to do? Yes, I used to smoke. Am I smoking now? I'm not. So don't ever let anyone bug you down. It's very easy, okay? Wallahu a'lam. Yes, sister? My name is Anuraga. I'm from 
it is a fact that all Muslims want to give da'wah to people, right? Right. Everybody wants to do that, but then not everyone has the confidence to do, to do that. Yes. They'll feel like they'll not have enough knowledge to give da'wah to people. So what kind of advice can you give to those who have lack of confidence to do da'wah to people? Fantastic question. Excellent. Um, a number of things. Number one, um, the best teacher is experience, all right? Uh, a number, oh, yeah, let me start with the whole knowledge thing. The whole, I don't have enough knowledge, this is just an excuse shaitan puts to, to slow you down. I don't have enough knowledge, and what's the other one? Oh, my iman, my, I need that on myself, my iman is weak. The scholars say if you wait for the day when you have enough knowledge, the day will never come. You'll die before any. Who wakes up and checks his knowledge today? Wallah, a hundred percent today. Let me go give da'wah. So it's just something the shaitan puts there to stop you. And oh, I need da'wah myself. Yeah, we all need da'wah, but we still go out and da'wah itself is conducive to your, your iman increasing. The scholars say if you wait for a day when your iman is full and your and your da'wah and your knowledge is full, they said you'll keep waiting until you get to your grave. Then they said, if you do wake up one day and your iman is 100% and your knowledge is 100%, know that you have gone astray. That means we do what we can with whatever we can. Abu Bakr anhu, when he gave da'wah and brought to Islam five out of the ten given glad tidings of paradise, so he was one of them, so six of them had something to do with Abu Bakr, right? How much knowledge did he have at that time? Brothers and sisters, do you understand how little knowledge was revealed at that time? Do you know what was available? It was just, there's one God, and that man وسلم, is his messenger. That was all the information there was about Islam. That's it. There were no pillars. That's all the information. Abu Bakr, second day, he's going and telling the five glad tidings of prayer, the five mubashireen, telling them that there's one God, and that man Muhammad وسلم, he's his messenger. Everyone in this room, has more knowledge than Abu Bakr in these early days, true or false. So take what you have and go out and try. If you want to become more confident, you can give da'wah with uh, someone experienced and watch them. You can just try with people that you're comfortable with and then move on to strangers. You can also try different techniques. Da'wah isn't just speaking to someone face to face. We had a, a brother, he would just get on the, and actually there's an entire organization now, they just do da'wah through chat. Um, I can mail you. I'm such a coward. I can't come and give you a pamphlet to your face. I'll mail it to your house. And I'll close with this sister because of time. But there was a guy in a, who lived in the hospital in America. He lived in the hospital because he's paralyzed from the neck down. Yeah. All right? He brought to Islam 100 people. How? You won't believe. He can't move. He can't even give someone a pamphlet. He has a pile of pamphlets on the table. And when someone walks by, he'll say, excuse me, sir, please take, that. that's all he can do, huh? Please take one of these and read it. That's all, end of story. He doesn't talk, go for the gold, that's it. Take one of these and read it. 100 people came to Islam. Show me one person in this room who is not more capable than that paralyzed man. There isn't. So go out and do the best you can with what you have, inshallah. And the confidence, the experience, all that, it just comes with time. All right? Allahu Akbar. Just one last question. Okay, sure, sure, okay, inshallah. Uh, one last question and then we we'll wrap it up. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Muhammad. Uh, mm -hmm. so how, how to overcome the objection saying that if a person can enter Islam, convert to Islam, but he, the same person, cannot exit Islam. So he get punished or executed. Okay. So maybe asking for a trial period, something like that. He's asking for what? Trial period? <laughs> so no, no refund. Just, just look at them and frown and say, no refund. No refund. Uh, okay, very good. So basically, look, um, you're explaining to this person that when you're, when you're becoming Muslim, you're recognizing and you're knowing for sure that you only have one God, one Creator and you recognize all the blessings came from him, and you now, what is the Muslim? It's the person who submits to this Creator, who does what the Creator tells him to do. So you've entered this covenant now, and it's very sacred. And we always give analogies to, if someone, most countries until now, if you, um, if you betray the country, they, um, what's the word, they uh, execute you, because 
How dare you leave your allegiance to your country? And these are just countries and boundaries that we have made. So this is now your allegiance to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But really, what you can explain to them is that the, the main reason this was put together was a deterrent from people to, okay, short story, very quickly. The Jews of Medina, they wanted to make sure that the pagans didn't enter into Islam. So they came up with this trick. In the morning, 10 Jews will become Muslim publicly. At night, they leave Islam. So they're saying, this religion is so weak and the teachings are so useless that we left it the same night. Maybe a religion is half good after two weeks you realize it's nonsense. But this is so nonsense that the same night the 10 left. Next morning 12 Jews become Muslim, at night the 12 leave Islam. Next morning 15 Jews become Muslim, at night the same 15, all of them leave Islam. So what was happening now to the pagan Arab watching this happen? He started to realize there's nothing good about this religion. People enter it and leave it the same day, not the next week, the same day. Remember the, the hadith in the beginning of Sahih al-Bukhari, when uh, Abu Sufyan, when Hiraql was asking him about, the, about Islam, and then he asked him, do people leave their religion once they enter it? And then in the end he explained to him why I asked the question. He said, I asked you that because if people leave when they, quickly, that means there's no substance there. So the Jews were doing this trick so everyone else thinks, oh, there's, there's nothing in Islam. I mean, people leave it the same day they enter it. Why should I enter it? Right? That's a deterrent. Then the Prophet ﷺ said, Man The one who changes his religion, kill him. How many Jews do you think pretended to be Muslim the next morning? <laughs> Zero. Yeah? So that's the wisdom behind that. You understand? So it was a deterrent to stop the rest of the population leaving their deen as well. And that's why you are free in Islam to leave, your, to leave uh, Islam. Anyone can leave Islam. Okay, in an Islamic state, anyone can leave Islam. I know that's hard to believe. Yes, you can. You don't have to go to Isha. No one will come and check on you. The, our records indicate you did not come for Isha. I'm going to <laughs> anyone can leave Islam. But within an Islamic state, the state is responsible for the welfare and well, religious well-being of the population. So you can leave Islam, but you can't go out and encourage people to leave Islam. And publicly saying, I left it, is encouragement for others. And it's a way to safeguard the community. And if they want to argue with you, we have the same laws now in secular countries. We have the same exact laws. And in America, for example, if you try to kill yourself, you get arrested. All right? It's illegal to try to kill yourself. And you can argue, well, it's myself. <laughs> no. The state has an interest in preserving the lives of citizens as well. So even the citizens are not allowed to kill themselves. So just make all these analogies, explain it in, in many ways, and tell them, look, but the main point is, Allah exists right now, and He's watching you right now, and He's giving you blessings, and you're supposed to submit to Him. So are you going to reject that based on some, uh, because there's a rule, of, this rule or any other rule doesn't make Allah non-existent. You still have this obligation, so still bring it back to da'wah. You just keep giving explanations until the person is satisfied. Alhamdulillah in our religion, always there's a good explanation that makes you satisfied. Versus other religions, the explanations make you more disgusted. Alhamdulillah, Islam. Jazakumullah khair again, everybody, for taking the time out and for having me here. Jazakumullah khair. And may Allah give you tawfiq and your da'wah efforts. Allahumma barakatuh. Muhammad. Assalamu alaikum. Wa barakatuh.